our, our next segment, and this is our, our debate. I want to introduce this by saying 2012 was a great year for liberty. In the uh, Republican primary, we had two candidates who were really staunch defenders of liberty, uh, certainly compared to the rest of the field. They were, of course, Ron Paul from Texas and Gary Johnson from New Mexico. Now, Gary Johnson's campaign uh, had some difficulty mainly uh, catching fire with the media and getting appropriate coverage and just getting into the debates. But that should not lessen his message or the, the things he had to say. And of course, Ron Paul was uh, blessed in being able to take it all the way to Tampa, uh, where I was privileged to be able to cast a vote for him. So um, in the aftermath of uh, that Republican primary, a lot of us are kind of looking at different options and wondering where we should go. And, uh, you know, some of us are staying in the RLC and uh, taking the position that the best way to press forward is to work within the party. And others are uh, jumping ship over to the Libertarian Party along with Gary Johnson and trying to reform things from the outside. So we're, we're fortunate today in that we have uh, a representative of the Republican Party, our own Dave Nall, National Chairman of the RLC. And we also have... Uh, Kathy Glass with us from the Libertarian Party. Uh, Kathy was a recent uh, gubernatorial candidate here in the state of Texas. And they'll be uh, debating uh, future directions and uh, trying to make their case for, for each, each, diff each approach. And uh, I, I think we'd like to start this with a uh, five minute uh, opening remark. Uh, have you decided who's going first or do I need to flip a coin here? <laughs> I'll let right. go first. Okay. okay. Well, thank Ladies you. Ladies first tonight. Yes. And thank you for, to the Texas RLC and Dave Nall for allowing me this opportunity to talk to you today about why I am working for liberty within the Texas Libertarian Party. Uh, I'm not going to abuse your hospitality by trying to do some Pied Piper thing and get all of your members to come over from the Republican Party over to the Libertarian Party. I mean, I'm not going to do that. First, it wouldn't be effective. And But do you think I would do that if I could? Well, actually, I would. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not. I'm just going to tell you why I have made my decision that given I have only a finite amount of time, money, and energy, I'm devoting that to work for liberty within the Texas Libertarian Party because I want liberty in my lifetime. I assume that we have a common goal in that regard, that there is our why why we're working, why we're doing what we do. Because we know that our liberty is under attack and we're going to lose it if we don't take some action. So this common why should unite us, even though we obviously have a different what and a how about how we go about to do this. Uh, all my adult life, I've loved to study history, economics, philosophy, and particularly how these things intersect in politics. And so I knew, of course, that the way our government was intruding upon our freedoms, then someday we were going to lose it all. But I thought that someday, that's the key word, someday, I thought that was down the road, probably when I was dead and gone. Well, in 2009, I came to see it a different way, and I saw that with all the bailouts and the Obama election, just everything just hitting us one at a time, <coughs> I realized that the way things were going, I was going to outlive my country. And that hit me in the gut. Because I never thought that that would ever, it's even a possibility. So I thought, well, I'm not going to let it happen. I'm not going to go down without a fight. No, if they want my liberty, they are going to have to come and take it. Mm -hmm. So I ran for Texas governor. Oh, now, there's a logical progression there that I won't bore you with, but, but there was some thinking behind that. So why not the Republican Party? Here's why. Washington is broken. Alta's pretty broken too, but we can fix that. Washington, I think, is irretrievably broken for the near term. So I'm focused on Texas. Not only Texas is a way to save our, tax, our constitution, our liberties, and our country. The two-party system is broken. It's corrupt. It's part of the problem. It will never be part of the solution. The two old parties who were mired in the ways of Washington, D.C., will never change. They will not change themselves, and you cannot change them from inside. So that's why I say these two parties, they don't get it. 
and they don't want it. It's corrupt, corrupt in the sense that money politicians control things. And you can do all the good hard work that I've seen a lot of you do over the years. And it, it's like falling on a rocky soil. It just doesn't bear any fruit, and it won't because they control the system. Well, and here in Texas, you've got supermajority. Uh, on every statewide office for 20 years. Has it really done that much for you? Maybe it's beat back some stuff, but it's not where it needs to be. And the TSA pat-down bill, anti groping bill, show it is a rigged system. They'll pretend to give you what you want. But why libertarian? Well, we have this bright idea. And we're not corrupt. Maybe a day when that would sound pretty lame. Is that the best you can say, I'm not corrupt? Well, it just shows how much corruption there is, that that really is a distinguishing hallmark. Now, the Texas LP needs to do work. We are not a strong, active, serious party. But everything that's wrong with us, we can change, and we are changing. And those of you in this room, should you make the same decision I've made? You're, you are what we lack. Your skills, your experience, your knowledge is what we need to make the Texas Libertarian Party what it can be, as it's a fertile ground for all the seeds of liberty that you're sowing. Now, I don't denigrate your efforts, and I hope that you won't denigrate mine. I'm just saying that you need a, a strong Texas Libertarian Party for two purposes, to be there at have a Liberty Canada on the ballot, when you know your Republicans aren't that, and also so you have a place to go. And that someday comes, as it did for me and others, that you've convinced you cannot work for liberty in the Republican Party, that you will have fertile ground to sow your liberty seeds. Thank you. Well, it's interesting. My history has led me to a different conclusion than Kathy's reached. Um, I started out in the Libertarian Party a very long time ago. Uh, I volunteered for the uh, Project <coughs> Bride campaign in 1976 when I was only 17. And I worked on that campaign, and it was fun. It was a good, good introduction to libertarian politics. And then I was a, a volunteer for the Ed Clark campaign in 1980, uh, where I was the uh, president of Students for Clark in Pennsylvania, um, and I was uh, ultimately a founding member of the Students for Libertarian Society chapters in Pennsylvania. Uh, and I went on to become the uh, vice chair and eventually the communications director of Students for a Libertarian Society nationwide, working with people like Justin Romando and, uh, uh, oh, uh, I forget what his name, Jeff Friedman, uh, and a bunch of other people who have, who have become known for other things since then, uh, like Paul Jacobs from uh, Citizens in Charge, um, who was a uh, chairman when I was a communications director. Uh, and actually, if you're in the Libertarian Party now, uh, you probably have brochures which still have language in them that I wrote uh, when I was writing. I also did writing for the LP itself during that period, uh, writing a lot of their brochures because uh, I had a background in doing that kind of thing. Um, and I was very dedicated to the Libertarian Party and and, and worked hard for it. And, took a break to go to graduate school, uh, and then uh, ran for office as a libertarian here in Texas uh, in 2002. And all that progression ultimately led me to the conclusion that while the Libertarian Party is a party of principle and has very strong principles that I think I agree pretty much with 99%, the problem is that its strategy uh, for changing the country, uh, for achieving the goals that Kathy and I both share of making it more of a pro-liberty country, a country that believes in the Constitution, believes in limited government, changing the government to get the corrupt politicians out. Uh, while many of those corrupt politicians are in the Republican Party, and many in the Democratic Party as well, the way to get them out is not to chip at them from the outside going after the bark, but you have to strike at the root. You have to go right to where they are. If you want to fight them, you have to fight them in their home turf, not fight them on the periphery of the battlefield uh, where decisions and ultimately uh, victories are not won. Uh, and the way to do that is to go into the Republican Party. Uh, there are two reasons that I decided to do that. The first was the Libertarian Party clearly was not supporting with its strategy an effective regional or nationwide strategy of getting people elected. By running multiple candidates in many, many different races without any real financial or training uh, or other support, uh, they were unable to get anyone <coughs> elected to a major office. Uh, how many Libertarians are there in Congress? How many are, are there in the Senate? None. Um, there are some people there who are Libertarian, but they're Republicans, and that's what really makes the difference. Um, and that's why I decided to work in the Republican Party, and I joined the RLC. And since I've been a member of the RLC, we've seen advancements. But when the RLC was founded in 1991, uh, it was founded by people who were former Libertarian Party people. Roger McBride was one of the founding members of the Republican Liberty Caucus. Um, he started with the Libertarian Republican Organizing Committee. It became the Republican Liberty Caucus. Um, and from there, um, we got some people elected in the 90s, in the 80s and the 90s. Not very many. But in the recent years, with Ron Paul in office, 
um, with the increasing concern that people have over the way that our government is going more and more away from liberty, uh, in 2010, we saw Republican Liberty Caucus in Dorsey's elected in large numbers state legislatures uh, to state off statewide offices in various states, uh, to party offices, and ultimately about 20 ROC and Dorsey's in Congress, uh, and another five in the Senate. And we expect to double those numbers this year. You don't see Libertarian Party uh, elected officials in either of those positions. Um, I'd like there to be some Libertarian Party people in there, but it's just not happening. Uh, and the RLC strategy seems to work. And my belief is that once you get enough people elected to office in your state legislature, in Congress, in the House of Representatives, in the Senate, um, once there's a small core group there and you get more people elected, uh, some people who are on the fence, who at one time may have had liberty principles but kind of wandered away from them as they became corrupted by the system, will be pushed back towards that libertarian faction uh, because there's strength in numbers. And if we show that we're the people who can get new people elected to office, uh, then that will draw a lot of people who are on the fence back into our fold, and we'll have more clout than we would otherwise, and we'll be able to change the system from within in a way that you really can't from outside the system. Thank right. you, Dave. Okay. Um. <clears throat> Okay. What are we going to discuss, though? Yes. Well, uh, let's discuss the strategy that you okay. say the uh, Libertarian Party lacks. <coughs> and uh, I don't know if it would surprise you to know that in times past, I, I would agree with you. But I'm chair of the political committee. I'm on the executive committee. I'm chair of the political committee. And we're going to have a new strategy. We're framing it. And it is going to be a serious party that runs serious candidates in serious races. And yes, we may still have a few of those paper candidates who uh, don't run active campaigns, and there's a time and a place for them, but that will not be our preference, and that will not be what we promote. We're going to run active candidates and support them and promote them. And we need a party to do this. Uh, I don't know if any of you are, are uh, old enough to have been around building the Republican Party, but there are books on it, how it was done, and it was a lot of work. A lot of good Republican women, mostly, just built that party, and it took years. And uh, y'all have come in, and you're trying to change it, and that's a different thing. That's difficult enough as it is, but building it is hard work. But we're going to do it. The Libertarian Party, I will tell you, has not invested that basic work to get it up to speed to be the kind of a serious party that will get election results. But that is our goal, and that's what we're going to do. And I don't think it's going to be all that difficult. I mean, it's not impossible, but we need to move fast. I have a very short time frame on this. I don't know how long this country has got. I don't think we've got enough time for a 30-year plan. And I want to see liberty in my lifetime, not just my children's. I'm greedy that way. But this is something we're going to do. And so I agree with you, Dave. When you were there, you probably saw things that said, this is not going to accomplish my goals, which is to have a party that elects candidates to office. But that's something that can and is changing. Well, I'd like, I'd like to think that's true, mm -hmm. um, but I haven't seen the evidence of it yet. When I was a delegate to <coughs> the Libertarian National Convention in 1980, uh, David Nolan and others were talking exactly the same way. And that was now 42 years ago, 32 years ago. Um, 42 years no, 32 years ago. I'm not that old. I wasn't 13 when I went to college. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, there's been a, a, a there's been a faction of the party all along that wanted to have a more realistic philosophy. One of the leaders of that faction, although I don't agree with him on a lot of things, was Wayne Allen Root. Wayne Allen Root left the Libertarian Party two weeks ago and became a Republican because um, he had given up after years and years and years of trying to make make things work in the Libertarian Party. He just couldn't get it. There's a culture in the Libertarian Party, um, and it's a culture of you know, of sort of insider gaming. It's sort of an inside game uh, where it's all the same people talking to each other and having great philosophical discussions, but not getting an awful lot of things done, even when there are people like Kathy pushing them to try to get something done. I got tired of trying to herd those cats. Um, and there are some people in the, Royal, in the Libertarian Party of Texas, um, who you and I both know, uh, who are not easy to move around and get them to change what they want to do. Um, and I didn't think that I was going to be able to do that. I, I thought it would be harder to change the minds of people who are ideologically high bound than it is to change the minds of people who are corrupt and can be essentially bought off by numbers of votes uh, or by the perception of influence in the press or within the party. Um, it's a different strategy. It's different, you, know, you have to tailor what you're doing to the party you're working with. 
Um, and Kathy's going to be appealing to people's better instincts. I'm going to appeal to people's um, opportunistic instincts, which I think is very libertarian, really, um, when you get right down to it. Um, so, you know, ideally, what I'd like to see, of course, is for the Libertarian Party to be successful. Um, I'd like to see them getting people elected because that would put two types of pressure uh, on our system. Well, we're going to try to get your wish granted. And of course, one way for that to happen, this is a beef I have with the Libertarian Party and have for years, is that they will run Libertarian candidates against Liberty Republicans who are as Libertarian as those candidates are. We had a situation recently in 2000, well, I'm not going to get to that yet. Um, in 2010, we had a situation here, right here in Central Texas, uh, where we had Jason Isaac, who's very Libertarian, who some of you are big Jason Isaac supporters, um, and he had a guy in the Libertarian Party convinced to be a paper candidate against him, uh, whose name was Tim... Tim... Gleisner. Gleisner, right. And Tim Gleisner, basically, when he realized that he was running against somebody who was a Libertarian running as a Republican, dropped out of the election. That's what he should have done. It was a proper response. Now, we have another situation this year that's very similar, where down in the uh, Rio Grande Valley, we have Jessica Puente Bradshaw running. Um, she is a wonderful candidate, um, Hispanic, uh, Latina woman, um, very libertarian. She endorsed a libertarian candidate in the previous election there, um, and she's been a big supporter of libertarian candidates, but she is running as a Republican, and there's a libertarian running against her, and he would not drop out of the election, despite every effort she had to persuade him. And she's in a district, and this is where I think it's very important, her district right now is rated about 54-46 Democrat versus Republican. That's a winnable district, but it's very, very close. She has to have a very good campaign, which she does, um, and she has to somehow get every vote that she can. And if one or two percent of those votes are going to a libertarian candidate, that's a libertarian who does, that libertarian won't get elected. And Jessica, who's also a libertarian, won't get elected either. And you'll end up with some status quo Democrat who's as bad as the worst of the Republicans that are in office uh, in there representing that district, um, which is a wonderful opportunity for the liberty movement because it's a district full of Latinos who lean libertarian. And if we could just get them somehow on board um, with a winning candidate, it might revolutionize politics in Texas. Well. Dave, I'm going to have to uh, disagree with you here about what's the proper thing to do in this situation. But first, let me point out that is very rare. We are talking about a situation, maybe one race every election cycle, one where the libertarian might make a difference and might uh, allow the lesser uh, li non-liberty candidate to win. That's a rare thing. But what can we do about it? They're individuals who have a right to run. Uh, people nominate them uh, if, if they want to, and for them to drop out, I'm not going to put any pressure on anybody to drop out. They took on a commitment, and if what they do is their business, I'm not going to say that we can sit around here and say, you run, and you drop out, and you go here. That's very unlibertarian to me. But what really does it matter? How much do you need in Texas? We're a one-party state, and it's the Republican Party. You've got super majorities. You, you, you act like it's gonna, the world is going to turn on, on one race. I think that if the Republicans had all of the seats in the legislature except one, they would point to that one lone Democrat and say, see, that's the reason. That's why we can't get anything done. It's that guy. If you gave us a, a monopoly on it, then we could get something done. And I don't think that's it. So this is, this is a false uh, problem that I see. It's really not an issue. Yes, you do want to see good libertarian candidates, and we do want to have, try to be selective about where we put them and how we support them and promote them. But we can't tell somebody, you can't run, or if you get elected, you should step down. And I think y'all are just good. Dave, you're just going to have to live with it, that that possibility that that could happen. And if it happens <coughs> once every two years, then try to be stronger so that that one race doesn't tilt everything. We don't lose our Constitution because of that one race. And again, I'm focused on Texas. And I think you're talking about a federal race. Me, it's Texas for me. It's Texas all the way. And that's why I say my line in the sand is in the shape of the state of Texas. And we, we need to push back using nullification. And that is, the, the Liberty Party is the only one that has nullification playing in our platform. We are solid behind this. So we have new ideas. And the fact that I'm out here going around talking to people, I'm not sitting around talking to my friends uh, or, or fellow libertarians on the committees. I'm out all over Texas. People are saying, where are they going to see me show up next? And I say, well, you just, just keep wondering, because it'll be there. <laughs> Well, I think it would be lovely if we could replace the Democratic Party with the Libertarian Party. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
and that, 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 we would try to outbid each other right. by offering more freedom. Well, that's the way it should be. We should be fighting to see who can be the most libertarian party in, in, in politics. Um, what's happening in the Republican Party in Texas, just to go on a little divergence here, um, we have a real problem with Democrats coming over to the Republican Party. Um, and the Republican Party is under threat. That's why we have so many Republicans in the legislature right now, because a bunch of Democrats saw which way the wind was blowing and became Republicans. Now, what I'm hoping is we can change things so that they'll see which way the wind is blowing in the Republican Party and become more libertarian Republicans, liberty Republicans like the RLC. Um, that's the cultural change we're trying to create. Um, it becomes a debate between, hopefully, a libertarian movement in the country and the far left, which is the other movement, I think will be a lot better off. Um, and that libertarian movement can include both the Republican Party, who are more libertarian, and libertarians from a libertarian party. But the fact remains, uh, and I don't like to be a one-note pony, or one-note Johnny, uh, but getting people elected is all that matters. If your libertarian candidates were getting elected, I'd feel a lot different about it. Um, if they were getting more than 2 or 3%. Uh, and it's not just one election. I, I mentioned uh, the Jesse Pony Bradshaw election. I mentioned the uh, Jason Isaac election. Well, the mo one that stands out the most to me, uh, last in, in 2010, Dan Neal, who wasn't a libertarian, but he was a good, solid, business-oriented Republican. He lost his election after the recount, which I worked on the recount, by four votes. And there was a LP candidate in that race who got 1,200. Um, and Dan Neal would, be, would have been infinitely better than Donna Howard, who's in the, in the legislature now. Um, and, you know, I don't, I, wouldn't, I don't know what kind of, how great Dan Neal would have been, but Donna Howard is terrible. Um, so it only could have been better. Um, so in, in a lot of cases, and this is what a lot of libertarians complain about, you know, it's voting for the lesser of two evils. But what I always say is, the lesser of two evils isn't more evil. They're less evil, right? And voting for less evil is good. And if we vote for less evil again and again and again, then each time we do it, there'll be less evil than there was before, and eventually there won't be any evil anymore at all. Um, and once, once you vote for less evil enough, then you get to vote for people who are actually good. Um, because the, the line, the distance between the good and the evil that you're voting for becomes smaller and smaller each time until finally you can vote for candidates who represent everything you would want uh, in a candidate. And it wouldn't take that long. I think the way things are going right now, we can see the sort of geographic, geological <coughs> shift in the political system within 10 years. Uh, and, and Kathy keeps saying, and this is sort of interesting, this, as an aside, she keeps saying uh, she wants to have liberty in, in her lifetime. Um, I'm actually working on a book, which is about halfway finished, called Liberty in Our Time, uh, which is about the need that we have to, to establish this liberty base for our government, reestablish it, um, before much more time passes. Because we think we both agree we can't afford to have things keep going the way they've been going. Um, so I've got there a question. You want to? Uh, what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll let the uh, uh, two representatives go a little longer, and, uh, and then we'll open it up for questions after that. So please hold your questions. Sorry, Dave, but I can't let you do that. <laughs> <laughs> Open the pot. There he goes again. The lesser of two evils, Ayn Rand said it's still evil, and a little bit of poison, a little bit of good food is poison. Your one vote matters to you as a signal of what you want. When you vote for something you know you don't want and are going to be dissatisfied with when you get it, whose fault is it that what you wind up with? And the wasted vote syndrome has in, increasingly got worse candidates in the Republican Party because each cycle, the candidates are only as good as they need to be. And as long as you can say, well, if you don't vote for me, you get this Democrat, then they don't have to be very good. And it ratchets down cycle after cycle after cycle. Just for once, start voting for what you actually want so that if you get it, you just might be satisfied. But we've already seen that trend reversed. I may interrupt. Here in Texas, we saw Ted Cruz running. And Ted Cruz had nullification, and he had anti-NDAA, and he had anti-CISPA, and he had a bunch of other pro-liberty issues in his platform, and he won an overwhelming victory against somebody who had five times as money as he did. Um, and you've seen this happening nationwide. This year, we have Kurt Bills running in, Mon in, in Minnesota. We have Thomas Massey running in Kentucky. Uh, we've got liberty candidates running all over the country. Um, we've already elected Justin Amash. We've already elected Rand Paul. Um, this, we didn't have anybody like this 10 years ago. So we're not going down anymore, we're going up. Um, so the system, the, you know, the approach is working. And the Libertarian Party is popularizing some of these issues, they're helping uh, by putting pressure on the system. But the system is going the right direction. I'd like it to go faster, but my thought is that this is like a snowball. You get a few people elected, get a few more the next time, and pretty soon you'll have more and more people getting elected and coming over to your side. Just as the Democrats are coming over to the Republicans now, the Republicans are gonna come over to the Liberty Movement. Um, that's the way the trend is gonna go, I think. Um, we, may end up, we may end up, by the time we're all done with this, with a new third party. Um, the Republican Party might split in half. Uh, 
Hallelujah. At which point I hope the Libertarians come over and join our half. Uh, but we'll see what happens. Anything could happen at this point in the future. Uh, but changing the system is what you got to do. Well, let's, I don't want, didn't come here to trash your candidates, but you can ask Ted Cruz, does he believe in nullification? No, he does not. He does not. He was raised in the system where the Supreme Court tells you what the Constitution is, and then you follow it. He will not do aggressive nullification. And just ask him, there's a, a, a nullify Obama petition going around now. Has he signed it? Will he support it? No, he won't. He doesn't agree with this process. He thinks that the Supreme Court tells us what the Constitution says. I don't know. He did support state noncompliance with Obamacare, which is a form of nullification. Well, we'll see. When he gets there, I don't think you'll, I think you will be disappointed with him <coughs> because he is a more establishment. I know he beat somebody who was even more so, but I think, he, well, is he going to end these constant wars of intervention? I don't think so. Going to repeal the Patriot Act? I don't think so. So, um, that, I, I don't think that's uh, something that you can count on. But if you don't get elected, you can't do any of that stuff. About being elected. Election so. uh, to uh, public office is very important. It's a means to an end. It is not the end in of itself. And if you keep being successful in electing your guy to office, but they don't do anything or they do the wrong thing, then you've got to, uh, Ayn Rand says, examine your premises. You are doing something wrong. You're laboring in the wrong field. You're working mightily to sow this crop, but it's on rocky soil. It's not you, it's not your fault, you're just in the wrong ground. And you've got to change something to make it happen. And again, try it, how many times you're gonna try it? I don't know, I, I had my fill and, and I stopped trying, but everybody's gotta make their own decision based on their own experience. Sometimes I wonder if libertarians know Republicans. Um, because this rocky soil analogy is one that bothers me because if you go out and actually talk to grassroots Republicans, they're not rocky soil, their hearts and minds are dedicated to the ideas of our founding fathers. Uh, they believe in the Constitution. They believe in small government. Um, they may not be quite as fanatical about it as your hardcore, ideologically, philosophically libertarian folks, um, but most people, when you get right down to it, believe in liberty. Um, and in the Republican Party, uh, it, there is a real divide between the leadership of the party um, and the grassroots of the party. And your Tea Party folks, the people you go out to meet at Republican clubs or in Republican uh, executive committees, most of those people, when you talk to them about an issue, are going to tend to agree with your libertarian philosophy. Um, there are a few people who don't, and on certain issues, they're a little wacky, but there's some libertarians who are wacky on some issues, too. Um, like, they took the immigration plank out of the platform in 2002, which I was not happy with. Um, you know, so everybody got a little bit of diversity within their party, and that's good. Um, but the Republican Party is much more pro-liberty at the grassroots than you think it is. And really, I see the struggle here is not between the Republicans and the Democrats not between the Republicans and the Libertarians, not between the Libertarians and Democrats and Republicans. It's a struggle between the established governing elite uh, and the people in all parties uh, who are working in the grassroots who want to change that. I'd rather team up with an honest Democrat who I don't agree with on a lot of issues uh, than with someone who's going to sell out whatever principles they have uh, for money or for influence uh, at the top of the party. I don't want the David Dewhurst. I'd rather have the Ted Cruz uh, who's willing to pander to us and then be held accountable for it mm -hmm. down the road. Uh, because when Ted Cruz gets to Washington, D.C., he's going to be sitting in a room with Rand Paul, Mike Lee, Jim DeMint, uh, and Paul, uh, Paul Johnson, some other guys, Ron Johnson, some other guys, who are going to be saying, vote with us, because we can get different results than what the other people in the party are getting, and we can actually change things uh, in a way which is very positive, and that will hold people like Ted Cruz accountable. And they'll vote the way that we want them to vote, because both the people at home uh, one of the things the RLC does a lot of is write-in campaigns and call-in campaigns. We will be bothering him every day to make sure he votes the way we want him to. And there will also be people there in the Senate with him, and this time I think five more RLC senators, um, who are going to be saying, we'll all vote together and we'll change things. I heard that many times, that they were going to vote for somebody they didn't want and then hold his feet to the fire. Well, have I got any feet fire holders here? I was, okay, it's hard to do. It's impossible to do. If they won't listen to you, while they're trying to get your vote, and you can't persuade them then, you're not going to persuade them while they're in office. So I think that's, that's a flawed strategy right there. But what, and I'm not talking about the grassroots being the rocky soil, I'm talking about the machine, that, the establishment that controls things and will continue to control things and do the way the money interest wants to. But what you, Liberty Republicans need is walk away power. 
Everybody needs that in every aspect of their life. You have more leverage when they think you can walk away. So the next time they say, you're a libertarian. You shouldn't be in the Republican Party. You should be in the Libertarian Party. Well, you just might want to use your walk away power for the best asset, best thing it can do, and just walk away. <laughs> I was thinking of, of the, the point of influence Congress. Um, Justin Amash, I was talking to him a few months ago, um, and he's a new elected congressman from Michigan, he's a very pro liberty guy. Um, and Justin said to me it takes as few as 16 phone calls to sway a vote in Congress from one congressman. Um, so your holding them accountable actually does work. Well, if it's and that we, easy, then why are we in a better shape? Because so many Americans are complacent. It's, the problem is not, the problem is a multi faceted problem. It's the corrupt people at the top who think they can just buy the election. And then it's the lazy people at the bottom who aren't willing to go out there and actually do things. That's what the RLC is all about. One of the big things we do is this issue advocacy where we get people out there and we get them to make phone calls and write letters and contact their congressmen and harass the hell out of them if necessary to get them to actually do what we want. And some of those congressmen are starting to respond in a much more serious way. There have always been some in Congress who are very responsive to their constituency and who are good, honest politicians. We want everyone there to be like that. And if we keep putting pressure on them, keep wrecking better and better people, that'll change. That's why I'm saying I, I'm washing my hands almost entirely of Washington. I don't even care about it too much anymore. My own congressman, John Culberson, his mother, Eleanor, was a libertarian. And he's gone over to the dark side. He voted to raise the, the debt ceiling. And he had a town hall where he tried to uh, convince his constituents, grassroots Republicans mainly, that it was really a good thing he did. And they were shouting him down. But he didn't phase him. And it's not going to. And that's why I say this system is corrupt and it doesn't corrupt people in the sense that people are lining their pockets with money well, well, that may happen yeah, <laughs> but it corrupts them in their ability to <coughs> exercise independent judgment they just bow to the pressure and if it can happen to my congressman it's happening all and if you're saying all oh, we need is 16 people to make phone calls well then we don't have 16 good people i think we do do the phone calls we've done the mailings we've done the emails we've burnt down their lines their phone lines and they could have told us that it's not that they don't hear us, they hear us, but they don't care. So, okay, I, I, I don't care about them. It's Texas, Texas all, because we have not lost Texas yet, and we won't. Well, if we get, make Texas strong, then we can be the bulwark, and we can take this thing back. But first, we've got to get our house in order right here. We have not lost Texas yet. No, we have. Everything I say about Washington, D.C. is just as true here in Austin. Um, our Texas legislature has fewer pro-liberty people in it than the Congress in Washington, D.C. does. Um, we've got Justin, we've got uh, Jason Isaac, uh, and we've got David Simpson, and a couple of people like Debbie Riddle who are kind of on the borderline. Um, and it's just a big, unresponsive mess, especially the Texas State Senate. Texas State Senate, except for maybe Ken Paxton, um, is full of people who are completely uninterested in liberty. Uh, the Texas State Senate is one of the most undemocratic, unrepresentative institutions in the country. Uh, the way it's run, uh, it has almost no accountability. You can't even figure out what they're doing most of the time. Um, and it, breaking into that system is going to be more challenging, if anything, than changing it to the very top in Washington, D.C. Um, so I, I agree that we need to work on them. But I don't see a lot of change happening as quickly here in Texas as I do see it happening on the federal level. On the federal level, uh, I think we were making a lot more strides. Texas has too few representatives. One of the things I can tell you from experience, uh, from my knowledge in the RLC, one of the states of the RLC has been most successful is in New Hampshire. The reason the RLC has been successful in New Hampshire is that in New Hampshire there are 450 state legislators for a state with a population the size of San Antonio. Um, that means that every representative represents about 4,000 people in New Hampshire. Here in Texas, your Texas state representative represents about 700,000 people. Um, so you have a lot more say in what happens in New Hampshire than you do down here in Texas. That's one of the things that needs to change. We need to bring government back to the people. We need to expand some of these legislators. Um, that will make things more effective. That's one of the issue things we need to work on. Um, just, just about to jump in over the chair. <laughs> yeah, I, I, first of all, uh, that concludes this phase of the uh, debate. Uh, how about a hand for our uh, representative? <laughs> well At this point, uh, I think it would be appropriate to open it up to some questions, and uh, I'd kind of like to either have questions to both or if you if you direct your questions to one of the two if you if the you would the next person would direct their question to the to the other one so uh, why don't you go ahead John Rowland a um, couple of reforms that might be helpful to com unite both of our efforts one would be to push for fusion candidacies so that the same candidate could run 
as both a Republican and a Libertarian candidate on the same ballot. Many states use that now, and it's working well for them. The second would be to do away with the primary system, which allows money to come in and buy nominations that they could never get if they had to seek only grassroots support in a caucus system. And I don't think you're going to make the headway you want for the Liberty, Republican Liberty Caucus as long as you have a primary system. Um, I can answer some of these. I just, I just want to interject something. I, you know, you mentioned the fusion candidates, and uh, uh, interestingly enough, yesterday I was just looking at something uh, like that. Uh, there's historical precedent, and that is, uh, of course, the election of 1864, where Andrew Johnson ran on a uh, National Union Party ticket with Abraham Lincoln. So such things are possible. But uh, I'm sure you've got answers well, to that, so far away. Nationally, I believe you said that the fusion candidate thing is a good idea. I agree, it is a good idea. But it's actually not that popular right now. There are only three states that I know that have it, Michigan, New York, and Oregon. And Oregon only just instituted uh, making it possible. Um, in New York, uh, which is the one which has the best fusion candidate system where you have multiple lines and different parties can sponsor the same candidate, uh, it works very well. Um, Dan Halloran, who's a, a longtime RLC member, uh, he's on the New York City Council as a result of that system, and he's now running for Congress. There's a very good chance of getting elected because he's running as both the Libertarian and the Republican and the Working Families Party or some other crazy party um, candidate. And that is a, that's a great change. Um, but you know, getting rid of primaries uh, may have a much worse effect than you think. They're getting rid of primaries right now in Oregon and Cal California. Already got rid of them. Oregon just got rid of primaries, uh, where they have an open primary instead of having partisan primaries. And the effect seems to be, especially in California right now that it gives more power to the party that's already in power. Uh, because it means that in the primary in California, what you saw in seven out of nine uh, statewide districts uh, was that you would have um, two, two Democrats getting the nomination running against each other uh, and no one else from any other parties. No Libertarians, no Republicans. Um, and in a few weird districts, you had a Republican and a Libertarian, a Republican and a Democrat. But it, because the Democrats already dominate that state, it gave them more power. Oh, any of these changes, of course, would have to be made by who, class? Anyone? Anyone? People in power. The people, people in power. power. And guess what? Do, are they satisfied with the status quo or not? Class? Anyone? Well, they are making changes <laughs> yes, in some states, though. But not, not in Texas. Now, I just don't no, think that's going to happen. I do agree that whatever system we use to select our nominees, it should be the same. The, the Libertarians are at a disadvantage because we go by the convention system. Uh, and it, it, we don't get by law. We cannot choose our statewide candidates until the second Saturday in June. When the Republicans and Democrats choose theirs most years in March, so they've had three months on us to get out there. And by the time I get out there, there's like, it's too late. You you should have come around sooner. Well, I came as soon as I could. So then we need to be put on an equal footing. And then I think whatever the rules are, it should be applied to both uh, all, all the parties. So I actually can compare I'm trying to pitch something in on your side here, Kathy. Um, <laughs> what actually has happened is that uh, one of the things we've seen is that in some states. Republican parties have supported ballot access and other, you know, evening up of things for libertarians. Um, in a number of states, like in Illinois, uh, in Georgia they did it. Um, but what you, who hasn't done it, of course, are our presidential candidates. Um, and Mitt Romney, for example, has been moving all over the place trying to get Jerry Johnson off the, uh, off the ballot. Um, but, you know, Republic, the Republican Party in general doesn't support that. That's something the candidates tend to do. And then the candidate, you know, Mitt Romney really represents to a large extent the divide between the candidate and what the party you know, members of the party really want to see happen. Because uh, most Republicans are pretty fair-minded, I think. Um, the hand were way up there. Okay, good. I want to <clears throat> just go through a little history here and get, get your reaction to that. You know, I heard two dates. I heard 1980, 1980, ever since then, you haven't seen adequate progress. Since 1991 was the other date that you mentioned. I thought when I watched the Republicans take over the House and Senate at a certain point. But I was witnessing the consummation of the Reagan Revolution. We've already been there once. You're trying to get right back to that same point where you've already been, it seems to me. But one thing that's constant is it's a Washington-based solution. So now what I want to know is what it is you have to see as far as success. You know, you said you have to see some successful Libertarian Party in terms of electoral results. What do you have to see in terms of success be encouraged enough to start voting for the things you really want instead of the least bad solution. Well, like most, I think it's directed to me. 
like most of the people here, um, I vote for libertarian candidates when there's no other option I think is worth voting for. Um, like, uh, you know, our ballot in Texas, we're not a state where we're limited in voting, you know, straight ticket. Um, we can vote for whoever we want, and there are lots of situations where I think the Libertarian Party candidate is the one to vote for, especially when he's running just Libertarian against a the Democrat, there's no question there at all. Um, and there are a few situations where there are Republicans I just will not vote for for one reason or another, and I might vote for a Libertarian candidate there. But I'm not going to campaign for those candidates, I'm not going to work for them, because I don't think that my single vote, or those of a few other disgusted people, which may add up to 23, 24 percent in some cases, is enough to win them an election. Um, not when there's, a Republic, when there's a situation where a Republican might be running instead. Um, that might change at some point, at which point, you know, if I see the Libertarians could win elections, I'd be much more likely to vote for them. But right now, the Libertarians that I see winning elections are doing it as Republicans because they've taken the strategy of voting the Republican Party. When I, was, when I ran in 2002, I got 13.85% uh, of the vote here in Travis County, um, running as a Libertarian against a Democrat with no Republican in the race. Um, at that time, that was one of the highest vote counts anybody had gotten in Travis County in any kind of Libertarian run. But what I realized is that on that ballot, there were people, I looked at all the stats, there were people who, 33% of the people on that ballot had voted straight ticket Republican even though there was no Republican running in my race. What that meant is that if I had actually spent more money, I only spent $500 on my campaign, um, and if I had been on the Republican ticket, I would have gotten right there immediately 47% of the vote. And if I'd spent some money, that 47 could have easily been 50% and could have won the race. That makes all the difference in the world. If you can get 33% more votes, um, you're a much more viable candidate if you don't have those votes. And as long as people keep voting straight ticket, I'd like to take straight ticket off the ballot, personally. <laughs> but I don't see that happening anytime soon. Neither the Democrats nor the Republicans support doing that. Uh, although I've talked to a lot of Republicans who would support it under some circumstances, I think. Um, straight ticket votes Democrats. in the 2010 was 60 percent of the votes in the larger counties, and then just a little less than that in, in some other counties. And it's higher among Republicans than among Democrats. And it is. So when you factor in that, uh, you know, Libertarians only had access to about 40 percent of the vote in certain locales, uh, our vote totals actually look better than they were because and we we just can't get get by that. I'd like to see that change. But all about the another thing the Republicans have done is a group of Republicans paid five hundred thousand, half a million dollars to get the Green Party on the ballot. And the the records that were disclosed said they did it for two reasons: because they thought it would hurt the Democrat, and they thought it would hurt the Libertarians. And so, you know, that's 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 a. Not, I think not, they think it counterbalances the Libertarians. Mm -hmm. Republicans are convinced that all Libertarian votes come out of the Republican Party. I'm not sure they're right, but I think it's still more Republican than Democrat. Um, in the corner, uh, we'll come back to this either. In the corner there. At the last uh, Republican SREC meeting, the state chairman made a presentation uh, uh, laying out the demographic problem in the party. Uh, the average Republican voters in their 60s, 80% of Republican voters are Anglo, uh, and Hispanics are going to be the majority of the state, I think, in four years. And by 2040, Anglos will only be 15% of the population. So I guess from, from, from either one of you, yeah. What does the future look like? How do we get a voting <coughs> majority in 70% Hispanic population that currently uh, seems to be trending extremely far to the left? Well, these, which, which option is the best? These for projections us? have been made for years, and they don't seem to be uh, panning out. But I say it doesn't matter to me what the population is. Liberty is the answer. And I have enough uh, faith and respect for people of other ethnic groups to understand that, that they can appreciate that and they don't need to be pandered to. So if it ha I don't think that it's going to happen that way. But if it does, well then liberty has the solution. I mean, what's the question? Liberty is always the answer. And I think that's something that we can, can uh, uh, count on because I'm, I'm not changing <coughs> what I say or my principles or even the way I say it all that much because of the, uh, the particular group I'm speaking to. Because for one thing, that doesn't work anymore. In these days of, of uh, instant communications, camera phones, you say something one way, you pitch it differently than you did last week, then they all know it. So if you don't just say what you're saying right down the line every single time, then they'll catch you as the hypocrite that you are. Well, my, my take on that, I agree somewhat. Um, Republican Party uh, has had a problem reaching out to Hispanics. And I think that from what I've seen in some of the elections around here in Texas, there are a lot of Hispanics who leave fairly libertarian. And I think they're an entry point into that market for the Republican Party. And if the Republican Party is going to survive, it needs to get new people on board. And I think it needs to get Hispanics, it needs to get blacks, it needs to get women, uh, it needs to get young people into the party. And that's what the party right now has failed to do. And this opens an opportunity for people like the RLC. 
If we can become an entry point for those groups to come into the Republican Party, then we can revolutionize the party, change its entire operating structure, change the people who are influencing the party, and make it into a new pro-liberty party. And it's those young people, those minorities, who can come into the party and, and change it who we really need to appeal to. And I think the liberty message appeals to them. Um, and that's one of the reasons why so many uh, Hispanics vote Democrat, is because the Democrats aren't trying to screw with their lifestyles, aren't trying to screw with the way that they you know, sort of run their lives, aren't trying to dictate what their family values are to them. Um, a lot of Hispanics, especially edu educated Hispanics, uh, tend to be very socially liberal. Um, not in the same kind of socially liberal as you find in central Austin, uh, but socially liberal in the leave me alone sense of social liberalism. Um, and, you know, in many cases the Catholic Church is guiding them towards a more liberal philosophy about a lot of things, um, which you wouldn't have ever expected from the Catholic Church in general, but here in, in America that seems to be the trend in the Catholic Church. Um, and, you know, we can play on all those things uh, to get them involved, but they want power. They want a more obvious avenue to having political influence. And the Republican Party offers them more of that political influence more quickly than a party which as yet hasn't proven itself. Um, so I think that we have a limited edge over libertarians in that area. Okay, we're uh, starting to get a little push for time here. Uh, I think we only have uh, time for about two more questions. Um, so, uh, maybe, uh, you go ahead and yeah. Yeah, just kind of curious, guys, uh, because I, I sit here and, I, 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 and I'm listening. I try to look at things in two ways. One way, uh, you have the idea, you've got to push the idea. The other way, you have to have the business plan behind that idea. And when I listen to you all, I see where you agree. You both agree that you need a party structure to make change. But whenever I hear you all talking about how your side does it, I always hear you running back to your philosophy. It's kind of like the machine does. The machine runs back to their Christian liberal. That's their philosophy. Y'all are running back to your philosophy selling libertarianism. When are you going to sell what the public is asking for? It's not libertarianism. It's not your philosophy. They're asking for small government. Not limited government, which is a lie. They're asking for reductions. They're asking for small government conservative option. A permanent small government conservative option in governance. Now, so that means you have to, as a business, you have to appeal to a wider market. Now, if you continue to go back to your philosophy and want to sell it, well, that's great if you're in church. But if you think it's going to grab the Democratic conservatives, and you see, America is made of small government conservatives. They really are. If you tell them the difference, that's what, they're not made for philosophies in religion, Christianity, or libertarianism, or any other kind. When they're thinking governance, they want small government, and that doesn't mean limited. So I ask you to, knowing that it requires a party structure and understanding the poison within the two, well, within all the parties now, when are you all going to stop selling philosophy and libertarianism and instead appealing to a wider market and promising a small government, a permanent small government conservative option, and you all doing whatever it takes together instead of going back to your philosophy and saying, no, no, we're more pure religious here and we're more people. No, 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 you're not. That's not America. America is small government conservative. Give it to us, guys. I don't know what uh, led you to believe that I was here debating <coughs> the libertarian philosophy. I'm here debating of which is a political party. When I ran for governor, I said, we're not, we are not. got the rap for being a philosophical debating society and we got to stop that and show we're a serious party running serious candidates in serious races. And so I chose my issues based on that. Not what appealed to me, uh, let me respond, I, I want equal time here, please. I want, I chose my issues, four issues, that oh, the Texas voters are united on across the board four issues that were serious problems that they thought well, our country was not going to survive, our state was not going to survive if we didn't get these four things under wrap, four things that had liberty solutions that, that liberty could tell them, and I stuck to those four things, and that's how I ran my campaign. I went all over the state, and I got a good reception for the people I was allowed to speak to. So I'm not here selling a philosophy. That's, you're hearing something that we didn't say well, here. Parties. But, Alan, but, but, but it's a, that is how you do it, and I'm convinced that's how you do it. Uh, you did it. Uh, you did it. That's love. That's and, and I'm head of the political co committee, and we're going to start... 
focusing on that. Talk about what people care about. Find the solutions that they need. I said slash the budget 50%. Yeah, that would take us back when we were 10 years ago when Rick Perry first took office. I mean, that's the kind of things I talk about. People was like, yeah, yeah. So they were responsive, and I did exactly what you said. But somehow when people hear libertarian, they want to say, this philosophical stuff, and, and we didn't say it, even when yeah. we don't see what they say. Didn't say what they didn't want us to say. They still think we said it. Alan, also, we're talking here to an audience that we know is mostly pro-liberty. Um, we're not out there talking to the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. What I would say to the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, what I'd say to a, to a room full of Republican libertarians and Libertarian Party libertarians, are very different. Um, so we do, to some degree, tailor what we're saying to the audience and the questions we're being asked. Are your messages the same when you do that? You mean, as far as, if we, we haven't talked that much about actual hard issues here. We're talking about strategy. Um, if we got down to issues, I think our messages are probably pretty similar. The only reason I asked y'all was because, <coughs> and, and what you mentioned was, was a wonderful response, is, Maybe if there were issues, and not transitory issues, permanent issues, and and no more of the religion, and no more. And when I say that, at least I mean libertarianism or whatever philosophy, and just issues that if everybody agreed on issues, maybe there would be a sort of a merger. We we well just to say that to respond to that we work together. Uh, I mean, we, we don't actually work together, but the Libertarian Party and the Republican Party, when it comes to the Republican Party, often work together on issues the same way. And RLC and the Libertarian Party have teamed up more than a few times uh, here in Travis County on some issues. Like right now, we're all together opposing this new hospital tax they're going to hit us with, uh, the huge 67% tax increase. I don't know if that's a hint. Maybe they're going to come in in their pajamas and next. One last question. question. And I know you've had your hand up forever. Dave, one of the issues I've noticed, though, is that a lot of liber liberty Republicans have gotten the third-party treatment anyway. I mean, they treated Deborah Medina like she was a third-party candidate. They certainly treated Gary Johnson like he was a third-party candidate. And, you know, and, I, and I've seen the way, you know, locally they treated some good people like Ken Weiss and Sam Osemi. They just ignored them and pretended they weren't there. But it's changing. Dick Vod is being treated like a major candidate now, and he's a liberty guy. Deborah Medina got a standing ovation at the state convention. Well, right. Yeah, I remember, I, remember, I, remember, I can't remember, action. but on a board, this guy said sure. also, if it was Hutchison versus Medina, I would vote for Medina. If it was Perry versus Medina, I would vote for Medina. But because it's all three of them, I have to vote for Perry. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know. I, I have no explanation yeah. for that reasoning. I have no explanation for the existence of Rick Perry. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and I really have no explanation for why he's been elected governor, was it four times now? And when we previously had never had a governor except for George W. Bush who served more than one term? Uh, there's something weirdly wrong in Texas. But the governor, remember, doesn't have much power. And I know you wanted to be governor, but the lieutenant governor, what you should have run for. No, That's no, where I, the power I think is. That the governor of Texas, that is the most important job in the world, and that Rick Perry, or not mentioning any names, anybody <laughs> that wanted to leave that job and run for president and to take a demotion, then that's that's seriously wrong. But he doesn't understand the powers of the, the governorship and he doesn't understand the peril we're in where the Texas governor has to be there, a liberty, strong-minded, nullification-minded uh, governor to push back on Washington because that's the only thing that's going to turn this around. But that's why I wanted to I, be governor. I have a question for you, Kathy. Will libertarians cross over the Republican primary and vote for Jerry Patterson to stop an establishment candidate from getting the nomination of the Republican Party? No, because we have to build our party. If we do that, we can't work within our own party and build it up. We've got to build this party, which means we have to stay there and stay focused. And, and if so you're Jerry, Jerry Patterson is going to win, this is Texas. There's not been Jerry, a excuse me. There has not been a statewide elected Democrat in 20 years, and there's not going to be. Jerry Patterson is going to win. He so has don't to win the let, primary to win. Well, he's going to win, and if he can't, then you know there's something wrong with your party. But we have got to stop foregoing, forsaking our own party and build it up. Which you have to do if you vote in the primary. Then you're, you can't, you have no decision-making power in the Libertarian Party. So it's one or the other. The Republicans had to go through this when those good women were building the Republican Party from the grassroots up. They had to go for years without participating in the Democratic primary, which was where all the action was. And they had to endure things where you could lose your business, your livelihood. Some people even came to physical harm because they weren't part of the Democrat machine. But they stuck 
stuck it out and they built something that they can be proud of. Too bad it didn't last. But no, nothing really does. You have to sustain it. It's not self-sustaining. So no, we're not going to be doing that in our homes anymore because we're going to stay and build the Libertarian Party because we've got to. It is. It, I say because of the way I see things, my framework, I'm here to tell you that if you want liberty in our lifetime, the Texas Libertarian Party is not just another choice you have. We're your only choice. So please come and help us. Build it. May I point out that your president, your own presidential candidate, Gary Johnson, is asking people to come over and vote Libertarian for one election. <laughs> Texas. <laughs> Thanks again. Thanks very much.